gentlemen. G'day, everybody. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Oz by Drone. I'm Greg. I'm John. Great to be with you again, everybody. Another great week of everything about drones. We've got some amazing stuff to talk to talk to you all about in the news today. It's just so full of stuff. We are full of it this week. But all full of, of it, that- we have lots of yeah. stuff. And I, I wanted to just jump right in the way, Greg. I know Ken last week had his dog, and I have two dogs this week on the show <laughs> with me that I actually three D printed uh, on the new three D Ender three. And so, not to be outdone, maybe my dog's quite not quite as cute as Ken's was, but I've got two dogs. Uh, Why uh, am I called two dogs? Uh, don't even go there. All right, so there, there you go. Very cute, aren't they? Um, fantastic, folks. Those um, that if you view of 3D printing nuts know exactly how much fun it is. If you haven't got into 3D printing, it's a robot you just have to have. They're fantastic. Absolutely. Fantastic. And um, speaking of technology, so we're having fun today. Our guest, um, eDrone, is sitting in a window on a screen over there to, to my left and looking... I don't gray. know. Looking not so healthy. How does he look to you, John? He looks grey. He's got an unable to receive video sign on yeah. where his head would be. So uh, that's a shame. But look, if we, even if we get some audio, maybe later on something we can he can scream. That would yeah. be good. <laughs> if we had audio, that would be enough. We could we could we could live with that. But it is yeah. what it is. Anyway, All right. what, what have you been up to this week? Anything interesting? Yeah, fantastic week, actually. Um, apart from doing some uh, new 3D printing, um, we had the release of the Phantom 4 R2K. Which we're um, going to talk about a little bit later. We're going to talk about. We've been looking at that. I did some work for uh, council out in west of Sydney, did a great survey, uh, which turned out fantastic. We're going back to do an asbestos inspection. Now, that's one that um, around here, particularly for a lot of older buildings, is um, really handy um, for using a, a, a drone for. Obviously, you can get up into areas uh, nice and carefully where there's asbestos, um, the dull, dirty and dangerous, again, uh, yeah. being done by these fantastic machines. So, yeah, we're looking at those. We've got a uh, asbestos uh, engineer, expert, if you will, and uh, it's going to be his first experience using um, a quad to inspect some of the work. So we're looking forward to seeing how that works. Cool. Lots of fun and games. So just yep. before we get into the news, a quick little reminder, if we have any issues with um, the bandwidth today, um, if I do do a replay, have a look up in that corner in the far left over there. There will be a replay link over there. Um, I won't put that there unless we have problems, but that's where it'll be. Okay. Moving right along. Let's get started with the news. Time to jump into the news. Well, folks, you might have all seen this. I reckon, Greg, we should roll the video and have a look at uh, Dayton University has um, done an impact test uh, at their physics lab, and they have slammed a look what looks like to be a Phantom 3, Phantom 2, into the wing of an aeroplane at 238 miles an hour. Have a look at this if you haven't seen it. Let's play the video. well here it comes now check this out the thing goes inside oh look at this straight in battery and all that just eats it lose an engine the only thing you lose out of there is an engine um look how much damage did the plane do to the drone oh <laughs> i don't know I, I reckon i don't know how dji care would really cover that one i mean that's a that's a real that is a new hull a new shell and perhaps a bit more. Uh, a couple of things about that. It looks like a light aircraft wing. Uh, you know, we can pull this apart pretty easily. Um, it is what it is. They, we're going to start seeing these sort of videos now, and people are going to use them to get uh, a lot of clickbait. Um, you know, everyone's talking about the University of Dayton Research Centre. I am, Center I am, I am, I am a little it. bit disappointed in the fact that this was university research. And, you know, yeah. you, you would expect quality research out of a university. But, you know, the first thing you that think- I say... What speed was the plane wing traveling at and does that approximate reality? And if not, what effect does that change in the experiment have? That's right. Well, uh, true. It wasn't actually a wind tunnel test. It was a cannon test. Um, They use this for bird strikes. Um, They chose the wing. I would have chosen the windshield of an aircraft, um, light aircraft particularly, a different sort of risk level. 
But again, there's no fuel inside the wing at that section. So once you've got fuel inside the airframe, um, very little uh, chance of it penetrating, I'd say, that, so that mass. Um, plus the skin is also stronger, so they've you know, picked a weak section. Look, they've just done what they've done. Uh, they've put it up. They wanted to show it. looks cool, and so everybody's looking at it. 238 miles an hour for a light aircraft wing? Mm, maybe hmm. not. Um, What's you know, the? I, I, I was reading somewhere the published, um, I, I don't know the aviation term, but the maximum speed published with its type certificate or something, and it was way below that. Yeah, it is. Mostly a V&E of a light aircraft, you know, 200, uh, 220 knots. Um, they really get above that for airframe stresses. So, and that's, uh, you know, that's up there. So they have, the airplane have to be going pretty much right on the red line um, to hit it that fast. And at low level, less likely. You know, an airplane in cruise, uh, a nice fast Mooney or whatever might be doing that, um, you know, going on descent. But once it gets lower to the ground below 1,000 feet, the aircraft's decelerated, you know, preparing to land or whatever usually unlikely so we're, we're just putting it out there to have a look at what happens when you smack um one of these things into a piece of aluminium basically um yeah. and, and and hit it right where there's no rib so just my my quick comment uh, you know the wing's not moving so there's no airflow over the wing yeah if no there was layer. airflow there'd be a cushion effect which takes a what reduces significantly the chance in my opinion of that the drone hitting the wing where it did doesn't eliminate it, but it reduces the chance. No, it's right. If it came straight at it, it might go over the top. Um, but if it came from underneath, of course, then it would be if it was going to be sucked up with the boundary layer, it'd go over the top. Look, you know, we can armchair this and all, all day. Um, and again, we'll just come back to the vision is there. And, and we can't deny that it, it's smacking a, a, you know, a phantom into a piece of aluminium. That's what it is. And the, at that speed, that's what you get. So, let, let's, you know, why not show us five videos um, of the same thing, different speeds, different scenarios, perhaps a windshield one, um, you know, do the test properly. I'm sure it's going to happen. There's no doubt in the world. I'll tell you what, though, it'd be interesting, those of you guys that drive Mavics, half the weight of the aeroplane. I would have loved to have seen a Mavic, um, you know, and, and what would have happened to it um, had it had it hit. Uh, the aircraft like that in exactly the same way. Anyway, look, it's just there. It is um, what it is. It is what it is, exactly. But, of course, uh, it'll be used in all sorts of ways. It went mad. The press want to use it, you know. I'm sure what they'd probably do is show that video and then show an aeroplane on fire, you know, descending towards the ground straight after it. You know, why not put that in there as well? Yeah. Um, so, yep, scientific research, the media. <laughs> Absolutely. Before we move on to the next one, if I could just ask anyone who knows um, eDrone who can get in touch with him, let him know that we can see a picture in the screen, but it looks like a blob and we can't hear him. So he's going to be the guest after the news. So if you could tell him to reboot or do something like that, we'll see how we go. Technical Send wonders. Message. Send him a message. Send a carrier yeah. pigeon. Send a drone. All right. Here we go. Next story. Drone in a jiffy. Uh, we have the Xenon Adventure drone, an ultra-portable alternative that aims to make the setup process a cinch so you can do more playing and less assembling. Better yet, it's simple to store and transport. The portable drone is here to stay, and let's have a look at the drone in a jiffy. There it is. Uh, click two pieces together. Yeah, so this is um, a design that I, I, I'm unsure if this is concept or real from what I saw, but... Well, that's a concept. I, I, mm. Well, I did want to show, uh, yeah, look, I don't think they built it, but it looked interesting nonetheless. So the two pieces um, connecting together, the gimbal mounted camera down below, the yep. whole thing fitting in this case, it looked interesting. Yeah, it is. It's very nicely done. I mean, you, you know, now we're looking at, uh, you know, functional design. Look at that. That's, that's magnificent. Um, you know, not a working aeroplane, but wow, something portable again. Um, it looks like it would travel uh, in a very robust way as well. Um, and it might be a jiffy. It looks like a, you know, click click and play. Who knows? Um, fly it with your phone. Um, again, using uh, the technology that we've got, a simple quad, mechanics of a simple quad, and yeah. a, a flight controller, and off you go. The one so interesting question, though, I know that they um, mentioned in some of the literature that they used um, a, a strong magnet to go and couple the two pieces together. So I, I was just thinking out loud, hang on, if they've got a neomidium magnet, I guess they haven't actually built this thing yet. 
Well, yeah, once they build it, they'll find out about compass calibration, won't they? <laughs> yeah, whoops. So moving on from that, we have... Yeah, here we go. The 3D modelling. Um, and this is with SimActive, levelling uh, commercial up drone data. The SimActive's uh, Coralander 3D is one of the tools that enables commercial drone operators to level up and play enterprise level. SimActive has been a major player in the creation of photogrammetry solutions since 2003. Everybody's jumping on photogrammetry. Um, and look, the, I think the thing to point out here is with, with these companies that, that do it, you've got your automated ones, you've got your drone deploy, um, and you know I'm not going to pass judgment on any of these right here. Have a look at it. Um, because I think you know they all have a service and you pay for the level of service you want. Anybody that does this um, and does 3D modeling um, using photogrammetry and is a player, you're going to have a couple of other team members involved to do it uh, at a professional level. One is a surveyor, a licensed surveyor. Um, the other is some serious CAD software like Pix4D Mapper, um, uh, Argusoft, all of the others. And if you uh, are sort of playing, as I said, a commercial level where you've got uh, to provide data to a company that is going to need to put their hand on their heart and say this is what it is, then um, you might not uh, be able to trust it to a third party without having it checked by a surveyor and knowing what it is yourself. But look, there it is. It's getting better and better. And I think we're going to have the better solutions like this eventually. There's a point cloud there you're looking at in a picture. So it's not a photo at all, of course. It's a 3D model driven by um, the point cloud and uh, re-engineered to make a 3D model up where you can do heights and elevations, um, volumes and so forth. So uh, photogrammetry has improved mostly um, because of the power of computers. Um, it's very much like video production. The early days, we couldn't stitch and, and, you know, we'd leave a piece of video to render overnight. Now we just wait, you know, a couple of minutes. Uh, photogrammetry is the same thing. It requires massive floating point maths calculations um, and, and, you know, doing the tie point. So uh, to give you an idea, we've got 40 hours or so to do 5,000 high-res photos in photogrammetry. That's a big job, 40 hours of computer processing. So... Um, some of these online uh, people like Drone Deploy using bigger servers, multiple servers, um, help that process go a bit faster. So there it is, and you're going to see more of them. A good one, have a look at them all if you get in, want to get into that. Um, if you're uh, thinking about uh, doing a little work with your, your aircraft, then think about photogrammetry and getting on the YouTube and checking out what it is because there's going to be plenty of work in that regard. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, a message to um, our guest again, still getting the funny colour block. So if you've got another device or anything else you could try, feel free to try it now. Whoops, All wrong right. button. That was the wrong button. Oh, my own. All try right, this Greg, one. You... Oh, you got that one? Fantastic. Mind control. I want you to tell us about this one, Greg, because it's right down your alley. Look, Dr. <laughs> Evil, Dr. Evil's got nothing on these guys. So this is straight out of Russia. Play the video and... Basically, what you're going to see here, what you're going to see here is mind control of a drone in practice right now. Now, I'll leave the audio down low. We don't need to... Nothing up the sleeve here? No, nothing up the sleeve. Is this a kind of a gesture control? Are we really reading impulses here? We're really I mean... reading impulses. And if you watch along here with the text that's on the screen... Oh, look at that. Right. That's fantastic. Yeah. That is fantastic. And this particular guy has trained in it a lot. Um, and he can keep the drone flying for up to 15 minutes, whereas some other pilots can only keep it going for two or three, maybe five minutes. But occasionally um, it goes off the rails like that. But this guy is saying right here, if we could plug into the brain and link directly to certain neurons, we wouldn't crash so much. But... The pilot oh. says, maybe I wouldn't be racing to be the first one to do that. Uh, the truth is these days, if you're holding a controller in your hand, you are already plugged into the brain. And that seems to be the problem. Not yet, not plugging the brain in yeah. when we're flying sometimes, you know. So that's why, that's why they crash. <laughs> yeah. But certainly the use case for this particular type of technology is not for someone like you and I. It's for someone who might have a medical disease which is preventing yeah. them from using their body 
as we do. Absolutely. Yeah, just that imagine, would be just imagine yeah. someone with a disease. They can't walk. They can't do these kind of things, but they could get out and about um, and fly a drone and explore their environment around them. That is yep. awesome. But that is exciting. And look at the mobility of that. You know, you've got you've got um, uh, particularly people without mobility. Um, yep. If they haven't got mobility and they can use, uh, you know, a mind control for a scooter, imagine being able to have a flying quad that, um, you know, someone who is confined to a wheelchair, have a flying quad, control it with your mind, and off you go. I mean, you know, that that's not too, you know, I'm inconceivable. Just... I'm just trying to imagine right now, you know, those mobility scooters in Westfield being controlled yeah. by someone with their mind, but then all of a sudden, this hot looking babe down there <laughs> gets in their sight and all of a sudden they crash into the shop. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> moving right along. Moving along. <laughs> hey, we got our guest I can see in the background. Hey, man. Eric, I you're there. See. We, we yeah. won't have you on audio for now. We'll bring you up in a little while, but it's good that you're there. Yeah, good. I can see him. That's great news. Okay, we're going on. Uh, let's do a little bit uh, about r racing. What do you have here? So we've got a little clip. Let's play that one. So this clip is um, some vision that comes from the FAI design this is not the actual track but it's going to be in use in december i'm oh, sorry november or december of this year i believe it is oh, it's a practice track this is well this is the digital model of the track that they're building in november oh nice yeah that's looking good it is looking good but here's the thing, I just love looking at it full screen and being immersed in it and wishing that, you know, one day I'm going to go and get into the FPV thing as opposed to the photography thing. I want to be able to do this, so. Yeah, you know, the simulator, as all the guys say, the sim is the way to do it. And, yeah. you know, you can fly, you can get your skills up on the sim because you're still going to break a lot of propellers, but there's no doubt um, the sim gets your, gets your thumbs working the right way. Absolutely. So I've, I've ordered the sim and I'm just waiting on my controller for it. So that's coming. But we've got a few more stories. But you know what I might do just to kind of mix it up a little bit today? We might go to our guest in a couple of moments. No, we're yes. not because his picture is frozen. I can hear him there, but his picture is frozen. So we'll, we'll do he, another news story for the meantime. He sounds like he's eating breakfast. Yeah, I got I, him. We can hear you, but we'll we'll just um, let's have a look. No, your picture is still frozen. We'll just do one more news story, and we'll see how we go after that, and we'll see if we can bring you in. Okay. So. Um, Sky Dio's R1 drone expands to Apple stores now. Can be controlled via the Apple Watch as of today. R1 can be directed through a newly introduced Apple Watch app that provides one tap controls and directives right under your wrist. Yes, yeah, so there you go. We've gone from mine now to Apple Watch as well. Another way to control your aircraft. And um, have you got anything on that one for a video, Greg? We have, absolutely. Let's play. I always love that. Everyone's not smiling nicely when they're flying. That's good, isn't it? Here we go. And the kids are going to go out and play. Yeah, showing off the uh, 30 metre rule here beautifully. Uh, and, <laughs> well, that's America. Uh, yeah, that's right. I was watching this and thinking, I wonder if you were going to say anything about it, but of course you did. Oh, yeah, of course. Well, you know, it, you got to. I mean, it's the old way, you know, people, we advertise cars and, and people go, you know, show them going on a racetrack. And now you have to put a sign, you know, a simulated conditions. Well, you know, you're, you're advertising a product here that you don't use that way, I suppose. Yeah. Technically. Um, there you go. Okay. The look, Sky that's, Dio. Look, it looks like an interesting piece of hardware. And um, what we might do, we're going to go to our guest now, picture or no picture. So, Eric, let's say hello. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? 
Uh, yep, I, I got can him. hear you. Hey. How you doing? Uh, I'm doing okay, man. I guess we're having a little bit of uh, technical difficulties. We are having a little bit. It's uh, It's been one of those mornings this morning. You looked like a color blob before, and at the moment, we've got a picture of your face that is just sitting there, and, you know, you look like you're oh. about to eat something, I guess. <laughs> No, I've actually already eaten. I'm good. Okay. Well, let's let's um, get on with what I wanted to do. Tell us a little bit about yourself first. How long have you been flying? How would you get into it? So um, I've been flying now for probably about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And what my wife actually uh, got me into droning. That seems a she popular story. got that, me... That seems a popular yeah, story. she actually... Yeah, she actually got me my first drone, which was a little toy quad uh, from Walmart. And she said, you know, try it out, see how you like it. And I absolutely loved it. Yeah, look, it seems and, like um, a popular story. I say that because my wife um, got me a toy quad from Kmart, not Walmart. And the next thing you know, I was hooked. So thank you to the wives of the world that are buying absolutely. drones. <laughs> absolutely. Um, I actually grew up um, driving RC cars, gas-powered mm -hmm. RC cars. Yeah. And I actually grew up my whole life, um, you know, uh, driving them, jumping them, building them, crashing them. So um, I got out of that hobby because it, it tended to get a little expensive. Mm -hmm. so and then my wife was like, why don't you try drones? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We've got some videos of yours. There's one or two that I need to get my producer to queue up at the right point. So I was just giving that hint while we're chatting. The first one is um, your, your di hotel diving. Where was that at? So that was in Ocean City, Maryland. And that was about 7 a.m. in the morning. There was hardly anybody outside, which is perfect. Yeah. And it's actually not private property. Okay. Okay, let's have so a look. So it's a perfect place to fly. Yeah, let's have a look at that one. So... Hotel diving. Now, obviously, this is not a photography drone. This is definitely an acrobatic drone. What are you flying? So this is this is a race slash freestyle drone that I built. Yeah. It's actually the first freestyle drone that I built, and I lost it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Not on not on this not on this flight, but that's another day. Check out my channel. You'll see. But, but me, um, but, this I've, drone. I've just got to ask you, right? So you've only been flying for a short period of time, a year and a half. And to be hotel diving. Correct. That's pretty, pretty decent. Yeah, I, I started out with the toy drone and then I upgraded to a camera drone. Mm -hmm. Started getting into the photography drone aspect. And then my wife said, oh, they're having a drone race here at Dover Downs speedway yeah. you all check it out and i'm like oh yeah drone race like that's awesome let's go check it out yeah so from so there we went there and ever since i've been hooked mm -hmm. so we've got some um we've got some photography drone related stuff that we're going to have a look at in a minute now um i had some trouble with the audio in this one it was sounding a little bit bad when i was putting it through the system here live um, so I'll get you to kind of commentate what it is that is um, happening when we get that up on the screen in a couple of moments. But this is flying above water and you created some tips. So let's play that video and get you Absolutely. to talk over the top of that. Is there a way I can see it on my end? It should be coming through. <laughs> That's the wonder okay. of... Yeah. All, I, all I see is your guest. Yeah, so the, there's the something... And all I see is you, and he's he's doing really funny things in the background that you're seeing right now. But yeah, we got a problem between Australia and you from my home. So at the moment we're seeing the the dam area. 
in that video clip? Yes. Absolutely. And the, the, the major tip I can give anybody who wants to fly above water is you, you, you definitely need to be focused. You, you don't want to be distracted and have other people around you that are distracting mm. because the closer you get to water, drones tend to get a little funny. They start to act a little off sometimes. So certainly Especially this is with, the point when, where with you've all mentioned... The sensors. Yeah, this is the point where you've got on the screen downward um, vision sensors. That's a very good tip. But it's an interesting one because I've actually had mixed results. At some points, it's actually detecting the the reflection of the water and the, the ripples in the water and realizing that it's water and pushing back up from that. So, you know, that's what I've seen with my Phantom anyway. Okay. Mine seem to want to dip down lower yeah i don't know if it wanted to get a better reading so it went down a little bit lower yeah so but um there was a couple times i had to give it some throttle to yeah. um to keep it from going too low yeah similar experience i have when flying under bridges and i noticed later on in the video you're flying under a structure and i, I get that kind of experience there i'm happy to fly close to water and I don't turn off my, mm -hmm. my downward sensors, but that's me and that's my firmware version. You know, I don't want to go and say to someone, leave it on and have them crash. And I don't want you to say to someone, hey, leave it off. And then they crash no matter which way you go. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I would strongly suggest that people do a test in a controlled environment, right? Know, know where you are. Be ready to go and put that throttle up and understand how your particular equipment behaves. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, and, and just keep an eye on all of your stats. Yeah, absolutely. And what, your what signal, were you saying? Your battery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What were you saying about going underneath that structure that we saw in that video as well? So going underneath the structure, a lot of times, um, if, you're not, if you're not looking directly at your drone, if you're looking at the, your actual footage on your phone or your device, sometimes it can give the appearance that you're actually closer to an object than you really are. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And it can kind of throw off your orientation. Yeah. So in other words, don't fly only um, FPV. Certainly if you're very new to flying over water, 100% agree with you. Um, Correct. Yeah. And the other thing, like for me going under bridges, um, that is always something. And th we're just looking at that scene right now where you're, approaching that structure to fly under and it's, I don't know. It, for, for me, every time I fly under a structure like that, the, the, the drone takes a dip and heads towards the water and I've got to be ready on the throttle with that one. I've mentioned that before. Correct. Yeah. So we, I, I enjoy yeah, flying I, over. I had a lot of fun making that video. Yeah, I love flying over water. For me, I live on a river, so it's my flying field. I go out there um, every time I fly, just about I'm flying over the river and um, I love it. So I've got, one, I've got one more clip that I wanted to share that's um, come from you. But just before we do that, I'm just going to say to my producer, can you add the effects on my audio channel that are not currently added? Because they're missing on my audio channel down below. OK, adding it now. Um, so I've got one more video of yours, and that is a um, turtle video. So I'm curious of the people in the chat. I want you to go and tell me before we go and play the video, how many of you have heard of turtle mode in a drone? Um, it's something that a lot of the photography people wouldn't have heard of. Um, I watch a guy semi-regularly um, and he, he uses turtle mode flying with his, um, his little indoor quad and has a lot of fun with it. So let me just go to the chat window. I just want to see if people are, where are we? See if anyone's commenting. Uh, my chat's way behind, so it might take a while to catch up. Let's play the video. Let's play it anyway. Okay, so what we're seeing at the moment is your drone in a tree now Correct. explain <laughs> explain 
Okay. What is turtle so mode? When I, I, I have a lot of trees around my house, and obviously flying FPV, you like to dive the trees and, and you know go over the trees. And, and let's just face it, it's inevitable that we're all going to get stuck in a tree one time or another. Okay. Now, when you get stuck in a tree, it's very hard to get out um, because either one, your quad won't arm because of it being upside down or vice versa. Yeah. Um, but other than that, when you go to hit the throttle, the props are only going to spin one way. Yeah. The way that, that, that lifts you up. Now with, with turtle mode, if you, um, have turtle mode enabled on your quad, you can actually spin only some props and you can spin either direction a lot of times that can get you out of trouble and actually push yourself out of trees yeah look that is a, a really really great thing and i see this guy um helicopter is his youtube channel and he's flying around his little tiny whoop around his home and he crashes somewhere and he wants to just flip the drone turtle mode flips it over straight away every time and i thought what a great little invention certainly for that kind of a structure not going to be helpful to flip a phantom, mm -hmm. maybe, but the concept, <laughs> I'm curious why, why DJI, regardless, you're not going to be able to necessarily flip it, but they should still include something like that. If your drone is in a tree and you've got the ability to um, activate one or more of the props to, in a particular way to kind of shake it loose, that'd be really a helpful feature, I think. Yeah, I agree. Um, I don't know if has something to do with the the software and the limitations in the camera drones. I, I'm not sure, or if they think maybe it would be more of a liability with people not using it correctly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so look, it's a really useful feature and um, I thank you for going and sharing that. Again, people who are flying um, FPV, particularly if you're using Betaflight, um, do look that up. Have a look at, um, at eDrone's channel. The link is coming up periodically in the chat room from, from Nightbot sharing that information out. So thank you for that. Now, before we go, um, I think it's time for us to do something that we do on a regular basis when we've got guests uh, visiting us from America. So press that button for me, producer. I can't wait. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it's time to play Stop the Yank. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to play our favourite game, Stump the Yank. So, Eric, you can't hear the music and the fun stuff that's happening in the background, but there's some bit of fun frivolity in the background there. Now, I didn't, um, I forgot to actually prepare this the way I normally do. So I've posted a question to um, iSpike in the background over here in the chat room. So iSpike, please type in a, uh, a particular Aussie slang question that you want him to go and pick. And let's see if eDrone can pick that. So I'm looking at the chat room and certainly if any other Aussies other than I Spike want to do that, you're more than welcome. The first question we pick up there, I'm going to ask. Okay. Normally I prepare this a lot better and I have the questions. I mean, if we got John there as well, if I can get even John to pick an Aussie question, if I can get his microphone up, there we go. Yeah, here we go. Hang on. I'm plugging in. <laughs> I'm still here. Can you see me? <laughs> Uh, you're you're there in the background. I can see you. Yeah, I have. I'm I'm here. I am here. I I just had uh, something on the soldering iron that I had to get. Um, <laughs> okay. okay. Um, uh, first of all, uh, stump the end question. Um, what is a schooner? Uh, is it in Australia? Ooh. Is it a a type of old ship? Um, is it a uh, a German veranda, uh, or is it a large, delicious beer size? Mm. A, B, or C? I, I would say it's. I'd say C. It sounds like a delicious beer. Oh yeah, yeah. 
That is. We have we're scooters, Aussies. We're Aussies. Mid- we like middies. our beer. Yeah, we do. And and the schooner, <laughs> I mean, you don't even ask for a schooner when you go to the pub here. They give you a schooner. If you want a, if you want a less than a schooner kind of drink, well, you can wait for that a little bit longer and you'll get it, but it'll be a smaller glass. So there you go. That That's a schooner. <laughs> there must be some more in the chat room, Greg. Um, looking down there and I see Manic Magic has said, oh, I thought it said spank the yank. Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> Different type of show that. Um, yeah, I got, an, I got another one. So um, what is um, a Sheila? Is a Sheila um, a type of drink with an umbrella in it? Is it a girl, a reference to a, a girl or woman? Or is it a person who can't drink a schooner? Oh, trick question. <laughs> I, I would say I would say reference to a woman. Yeah, that's right. But you'd often say if someone couldn't drink a schooner, you'd say, Oh, you're a bit of a sheila. But yeah, trick these question. Days we don't say okay. that because I, I drink with uh, girls that can drink a schooner, so there you go. <laughs> politically incorrect. Look, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Eric, for coming in today and being our guest. We did have some internet challenges, but um, uh, nothing we can do about that today. It is what it is. But thank you for having your still picture on the screen. <laughs> yeah, it was great. Man. Awesome. Good I'm stuff. glad you can at least hear me. We great can hear videos you. Videos too. Great yeah. stuff. I'm okay. glad you can hear me at least. Thanks okay. for having me, guys. Thanks, yeah. Eric. And just Happy a reminder. Time. Just to remind everyone, check out Eric's channel. Um, there's a link that's popping up in the chat room um, periodically, so please do have a look at that. Now, moving on, I'm just going to have a pleasure. See ya. Thanks, Eric. So I'm just going to have a look through the um, uh, news items, and I want to do one more, which is 1.9, definitely. We kind of paused the news before. Um, let's just have a quick look at this one. I'm getting mine up now. So this is a video shot by um, um, some Australian law enforcement, the Allura Police um, Rescue Squad. Um, they just wanted to share that, you know, they're using drones as well. And this is an incident that happened where they used a drone to film this and they provided the footage of this to the fire brigade when they arrived a few minutes later. So this is where someone has um, placed a large pile of um, dumped rubbish, which they've put in in this particular location, which is in, where was it? I think it was in Berkeley. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so it, someone's dumped the rubbish, they've set it alight, spread to surrounding grass and bushland. Um, they're using a stock standard Phantom 4 for the recon and they put it to good use. So thanks to um, Mick Malloy for sharing that video to us. Cool. Really good use of a drone. Um, I'm just looking to see if there's anything else that we absolutely must do. And I'm going to do 1.10 really quickly. And this is just a photo, a really quick one. So the title here is Got Drone, and the word got um, being Game of Thrones, just sharing that the Game of Thrones producers are actually using drone tech to get rid of season eight leaks. So they're actually using one of those drone cannons to go and shoot down drones that are above their shooting area where they're filming the show. Ah, uh, there you go. Yeah, look, <laughs> just an interesting story, and I thought I'd share that. Well, you're going to see more of that type of tech all the time, of course. But I, I imagine that's a big deal for the movie industry. You know, they're going to they're relying on on big budget, spending big budgets to keep those secrets in place. Yeah. Um. And uh, yeah, these days, of course, probably quite legally, you can uh, you can fly in a position where you could look at those things and um, share the information. Who and wants to do that? Who wants to spoil? I don't know. Look, Why would they're... you want to do that? It's an interesting question. The people who are flying the drone are probably doing it legally. The question is, is the act of shooting it down? I know certainly in Australia it's um, questionable. Um, it's not, I don't... Yeah, it's not legal. It's because it's an aircraft. You can't interfere with an aircraft, particularly if it's not over your private land and, and also if it's not interfering um, with your enjoyment of that land, I suppose, too. But Absolutely. You can, obviously, this is the way the paparazzi works. I wonder if the paparazzi 
sometimes um, approach their rules rather loosely as well. <laughs> yeah. So let's move on. We've got a, the big news that we spoke about at the beginning of the show with uh, RTK being released by DJI. Yep, RTK is finally here. We knew it was um, they were releasing it in China. DJI have been working on this for a couple of years now, and it is to have real-time kinetics uh, attached to their aircraft. Now, you know you can have a matrice with RTK. Here is my, if I can, very brief uh, couple of sentences on how to explain RTK for those of you that are going to why the hell you would pay 8500 Australian dollars for a Phantom 4 that has RTK on it and what is RTK. But well, before folks, we do that, but oh, before yes, we do go. that, we've got a clip. Oh, gosh, show the clip, <laughs> yeah, please. Setting up ground control points used to be a time-consuming process. In the past, we needed 20 to 40 GCPs per square kilometer, which took several hours to place. By deploying the Phantom 4 RTK, we can reduce the number of GCPs to 3 to 5, and even to 0 under certain circumstances. For us, the Phantom 4 RTK is another step forward in making construction surveying with drones simpler. It is compact and flexible, and therefore can be a useful tool for our teams at Strabag. In order to use all the benefits of the fully integrated system, in RTK mode, we are using network RTK services to achieve even more accurate results, especially in areas with bad mobile network coverage, the DRTK2 mobile station can be connected with ease. The long battery life of up to 30 minutes allows us to map large areas during a single flight. The Phantom 4 RTK provides an integrated flight planning app in the remote control, including all relevant surveying parameters to make flight planning easy and efficient. This helps us to gather consistent data that can be easily processed with accurate results. If the area is too large to map on a single battery charge, the Phantom 4 RTK will automatically resume the mission at the same point after the battery has been replaced. Yeah. Now, I've watched the clip a couple of times. So um, that, that sort of describes its use model there. So you can see people building um, those kind of construction companies and wanting to get real accurate survey stuff. At the moment, we're doing that with ground control targets. You saw them putting a ground control target down in the beginning, then taking the photos, the photogrammetry, the overlapping photos, and then adding the ground point controls into the imagery so that you get accurate an accurate model. Now, so let me, case, can I just rewind and pause just to explain it, make sure I've got it in my mind as well, right? So you've got the, the, the square thing with the crosshash thing. You put your little spike thing in the middle. It's doing some GPS coordinate stuff, and it's getting yep. an accurate position exactly where that center point is. Correct. That's right. So, yep, that's correct. So the first thing to say, where's, well, why not just a GPS position? What's RTK as, itself? RTK stands for real-time kinematics. So what GPS was never designed for this. It was not even, a, not even close. When GPS was first uh, imagined, no one thought you'd be wanting centimetre-level accuracy. We dreamed about the days we could land a plane and have metre accuracy. But to have centimetre and indeed you know, down to even millimetre accuracy in some cases, requires one special ingredient to GPS. And that is that the as the GPS signals, the time signals, pass through the ionosphere uh, and the atmosphere, they are um, changed by refraction, by radio refraction. So the way GPS simply works is you've got these satellites that are, uh, are transmitting a time clock, the exact same atomic clock, and because you're receiving... Uh, the time signal, the difference in time signal, it means that you can fix your position uh, anywhere on the Earth by the time you've got 10 or 12 satellites reading those 10 or 12 time clocks. Now the satellites drift, the time clocks are shifted. So it's, a, it's a, basically a really good system. But no matter what you do in terms of correcting that, you're always going to have this refraction through the ionosphere of the signals that is going to adjust and change the time clock. So because you can read the ionospheric change, then what you could do is make another adjustment for that. So what real-time kinematics does is it says, if I'm in this place on the Earth and with today's sunspot activity at this actual time 
and the actual condition of the ionosphere at the time, I can correct my time signal and correct the GPS signal to get a much stronger signal. Now, if you don't have real-time kinematics, you can have post-processing kinematics, which means I could go and fly that site, and then later I could go back to the GIS information um, laboratory and say, I was in this location on this day at 11.42 in the morning, and I shot this photo. Um, with this GPS position, what would I need? To, what would I need to do to correct it? And they can, you can post process your kinematics. Now, what we've finally come to now with, with real time kinematics is this ground station that you saw him setting up there is collecting the actual ionospheric data for the area that he's flying in, and it's accurate for anywhere up to a hundred kilometres in that area, or basically, um, and that sending that correction to the aircraft so that when it takes a photo and it's got a GPS position, it's a corrected GPS position. And when the aircraft writes the tag on the photo, and you know all of your photos have excess tags on them, GPS position, that's an RTK GPS position, and it's centimetre level accuracy. So that when the photos are stitched and you've got such an accurate photo stitch that you can get that sort of level. Now, where it says you can have only one control, no control points, not quite right. You can have centimetre accuracy in X, Y, and Z, but if you want to reference it to the earth into actual height above mean sea level, you have to have one point in the photo at least where you are tying that to the earth, uh, the actual surface of the earth, so the model can be adjusted. Now, it sounds all a whole lot of technical stuff, so I'll, I won't go on much more. You can find out all about RTK, Probably not the place to do it on this show, but you can you certainly can find out about it. I'll give you an idea though, to buy that unit with the ground station in Australia is fifteen grand. You only get one battery, um, but it's going to cost <laughs> you. You're going to get fifteen grand is going to get you the base station about six thousand two hundred or so. The aircraft's about eight and a half, and that will still be ten thousand dollars cheaper than another off-the-shelf RTK solution such as the Matrice. So at the moment, at, here at MAR, we do, we do um, uh, RTK GPS by using ground targets only, and we, we take for a, a 30 or 40 uh, um, hectare site, we take about 25 to 30 ground targets, and we get centimetre level accuracy too. Mm. When uh, you can't put the ground targets down or you're in a really in, um, you know, challenging environment to do that, a real-time RTK is going to be the future. And so um, my company is looking at that right away. Um, and going to be doing it very soon. So okay. big bucks, but big results. There useful, you go. That's the long useful, answer. Useful, useful information. I'll just go to one point. They've got someone in the chat room, who, Bob Brown, who's saying these RTK drones are region specific, so you can't take them overseas. Well, yeah, that that's quite possible. Um, and I don't, I haven't got that information, Bob. It probably is right um, it, because of who knows. Maybe maybe there are a limitations. Uh, on their use, I think um, that'd be manufacturer imposed. I don't know that there's any technical yeah, reason. Look, I wouldn't. I wouldn't put it past DJI actually to protect, um, you know, their 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 product. Um, we ha we saw that with CDs, of course. We had and DVDs. We had region specific players, region specific. Um, those of you in the US might know that, might not know that was to control the copyright um, mm. of it. And look, it could be as simple as that. And, you know, if they've done that, so be it. I mean, we'll get an aircraft, we'll get one of those to run in Australia and probably won't use it overseas. I don't think, you know, people are necessarily going to want to do that. But it could be region-specific purely because of the frequency that the RTK-corrected data is being transmitted on. So um, I don't know what you think about that, Bob, but um, obviously we use 900 um, uh, uh, hertz, you know, the, the UHF to send RTK data. Um, between our devices, our rich um, things. So you can probably select it. Um, maybe that that's possible inside the machine. But, of course, one of the things that we have in Australia which is challenging is that we've got different frequency spectrum, um, you know, to licensing. So in terms of um, having, you know, commercially available spectrum, um, you'd have to have it region-specific. It's like FCC, ECC yeah. and all of that stuff, you know, same sort of deal. Absolutely. Look, um, it's been an interesting topic and certainly one that I'm interested in learning a bit more about. I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to skip to section um, six on viewer videos. Um, 
just yes. to, yeah, look, we, we had some videos that people have individually sent in. And after that, we're going to have a look at the usual Oz video section, just mixing it up a bit. The first Good. one we've got is Thunderbird 6 is the person who um, filmed this and he's created um, a video. Let's play the video and I'll explain what it is. So this is the Bundaberg Old Bridge. This is the Bundaberg Old Bridge. Um, it's also known as the Burnett Bridge. It's a heritage listed road bridge crossing the Burnett River from Key Street, Bundaberg Central, through to Perry Street in Bundaberg North um, in Queensland, Australia. Designed by, on, Alfred, uh, yeah. designed by Alfred Barton Brady and built in 1900, also known as the Burnett River Traffic Bridge. So just something interesting that he sent in, and I just wanted to share that. We've got another one where we've got someone from the uh, the MIDRT 2018. So this is the Military International Drone Racing Tournament in Sydney. Um, this one was um, submitted by Dean Watson, and um, it's a practice round of his. Yeah. Some nice FPV fun in there. But I think it's really, really smart of um, our armed forces to go and have the, you know, international drone racing in Sydney because, you know, people who are interested in um, piloting skills, they're, they're going to be learning different skills that's going to sharpen them up for their, for their day job, I would think. Well, again, you know, you might not know overseas, folks, but the Australian Army, the Australian Regular Army, has their own drone racing team, and the boys are good. Yep, I've seen them a couple of times. They know they know how to fly, and they just race. What a gig! Go join the army, get paid to race. You got to think that that hey, that just sounds fantastic, doesn't it? Um, Absolutely. Yeah, the, the army in Australia is really quite progressive with their UAV, even more so, I might say, than the Air Force in some ways. Um, you know, the, the foot soldier these days um, is carrying uh, certainly the, um, the small helicopter UAV. I'm sorry, I can't think of his name right now. The um, Black Widow or something, I think it is. Black Hornet. Black Hornet. Fantastic little aircraft that is. Made by Fleur. Yeah, that's right. It is too. 100 grand or something. Mm. Big bucks. Look at yeah. that. Yeah, good on you, Dean. So then we've got one more video. We're just going to quickly flick to in a couple of moments. And this one is definitely an Aussie staple. And I pressed the wrong button. Try that one. So this one, oops, and I pressed the wrong button again. I am so, so silly today. Let's there try go, that again. Warasa. So this one is drone mustering with dogs. And um, Greg Hilton, who puts together um, a lot of our material, he's gone and taken the time to edit this up and... Fit Does he mean dog into... mustering? <laughs> Two dogs. <laughs> Two dogs. Mustering dogs. <coughs> That's around that way. Yeah, let's play that. So over here, he's flying, um, from what I can tell, definitely not a photography drone. Um, although he didn't specify, but just wanted to share some of this with our international viewers. You know, we've got these sheepdogs down below going and controlling and moving the cattle around but he's filming this by drone now the question that i had that i you know he doesn't actually say in the video is he signaling to the cattle dogs where he wants to have the the cows move to with the drone or is he doing that some other way don't know but nevertheless some um, beautiful australian footage Cool. And from there, we've finished up with our few viewer videos and submissions. So some really nice Australiana in there. Um, did I get... Did we do the... Uh, we haven't so you, done section four yet, have we? No. You've gone out of order now. You've I've gone around. out of order. So I'm going to go okay. to four. Look, it's okay. It doesn't matter. 
it's Mick Sunday. Malloy, who sent us something before. We've got something really cool here. So this is um, an Amina Beach Sunrise. So he shot that. You minor. You minor. You minor. So this was in response to the reflections ask, and you saw just there some reflection in some of the water. Go, Mick. Go, Beautiful. Mick, yeah. Look at that center, the horizon, everything. Beautiful. That's, a, that's like a perfect uh, setup there. You've got, you've got the sun flare center right on the center of the screen and tracking straight to it as well, which is really cool. Nice work, Mick. Very polished. Yep. Very and we've tidy. Got Beautiful, beautiful. And we've got two from Stan. We've got some photographs. The first one is, um, he says, not a really good mirror, but the best I could find. And it's nice country anyway, taken with his Mavic Pro above his home, um, looking right your way west. And the oh, second yeah. photo that we've got there is um, a Pacific Northwest sunset. So a couple of nice photos that Stan sent in there. Stan's certainly a regular in our channel, and thanks for submitting them. Um, I don't know what we're going to ask for next week. I guess it'd be interesting to do some um, freestyle submissions next week. That'd be really cool. Next week, we've got as our guest um, Ed Ricker next week. So I encourage you to. Oh, I've got Ken Heron Skyping me. I've got Ed Ricker next week. And uh, if you can send in some, some video of yourself um, doing. Uh, any freestyle stuff, that'd be interesting. But in the meantime, here's Ken Heron, everybody. <laughs> on the phone. Nothing like being live on YouTube. Oh, you can fix the audio here. <laughs> How are you are going, you doing Ken? Your stream now? Yeah, you're, you're, you're live on YouTube. I'm on the stream? You're on the stream. Hey, everybody. Yeah, I just, uh, I didn't know that, but cool. I'm driving through Nashville right now. I drove five hours to film Tessie's tallest railroad trestle. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wow. Okay. That sounds like a lot of fun, but I might, I might just finish up my show and I'll give you a call back in a little bit. Oh, I thought I was a super secret special guest. <laughs> <laughs> it's always good to have you come and join. We had um, Eric Marvel from um, eDrone is his channel, but that was a lot of fun, except for the video froze up. But we're getting over time, and I want to get my last little bit here. I'll call I you back in a bit. Okay, bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See ya. Okay, we've come to that point where we're going to go and have the Oz video, so let's do that right now. Off to see the wizard, and here we go. So starting out here, we've got something from Blue Planet Surf. And by the way, thank you very much to Greg Hilton for compiling our Explore Australia videos each week. From Blue Planet Surf, um, this is something where they're doing what's called foiling. And I hadn't heard of it before. It's the latest craze to um, hit the surf industry. Um, Organization founder Robert Stechik from Hawaii designed these things and mastering the art of developing these products. So from what I gather, you've got something underneath that's kind of like a winged keel on a surfboard. So Alan Bond, eat your heart out. And moving on from there, we got Murphy's Haystacks by drone, a drone flight over Murphy's Haystacks in South Australia. Um, these haystacks are an ancient wind-worn pillars and boulders of pink granite, estimated to be 1,500 million years old, set in the middle of a wheat field and surrounded by Mallee Scrub. They're one of the most popular photographed attractions of the Eyre Peninsula.
I can't see anything, mate, actually, unfortunately. So John is having a trouble with the vision today. We're having wonderful technical problems. So this one here, off-road racing at Three Springs, Western Australia. Um, this was 22nd to 23rd of September in the town of Three Springs. 313 kilometres north of Perth, Western Australia on Midlands Road. Um, this town was originally known under another name, Cadthanthini. They um, intended to change the name, but um, they forgot to do that and they are eventually reverted back to Three Springs. And this video by Drone Camera Action. And then moving on from David C. Birds of the Outback, flying over a flock of Corellas at Cadelga Waterhole. Cadelga's history reflects the hardships encountered by pastoralists in Australia. And, you know, this is a big, you know, dry country. Um, west of the Waterhole are some ruins of a former outstation with two main stone buildings with a homestead, kitchen and some additional stone sheds that were added later. The birds there, the Corellas, they're a type of white cockatoo, collectively known as Corellas in Australia. Three of the six species of Corella are only found in Australia. I, I always love watching, you know, filming um, birds and flocks of birds. Moving on from that, we've got some stunning never before seen footage of Kata Tuja, the secret of the Red Centre. So this is the first ever drone footage of Kata Tuja, which was filmed with special permission from the traditional owners of the land under permit from the Uluru uh, Kata Tuja National Park. This is also known as the Olgas. Um, it's a group of large domed, uh, large domed rock formations about 360 kilometers southwest of Alice Springs in the southern part of the Northern Territory, Central Australia. So these channels, the links to these channels are all in the description and encourage you to go and have a look at those links and check out some of those channels and have a look at some, some other great content there. And then we got some humpback whales at play, Northwest Coast Australia annual, annual whale migration is an awesome experience to see each year. And this one was filmed by Mr. Gazza 007. Now, I've got a question, John, just in case you know the answer to this, and I'm not trying to be the drone police, but I know you couldn't do this in New South Wales. What are the regulations regarding filming near marine life in other parts of Australia? Um, these days, it's um, uh, 1,500 metres um, horizontally and 1,500 feet vertically, or 500 metres vertically. Um, that's a pretty big um, uh, exclusion, but that, that's, that's primarily for manned aircraft um, because, you know, they do, they do seem to create a bit of havoc. You know, and we can talk mm. about a manned aircraft being anything quite loud, helicopters. I'll come, we'll come and chat about it again in a sec. I'll just quickly t talk about the next one, Sailing the Whitsundays 2018. Some drone footage from a sailing adventure around the Whitsunday Islands, Australia. Um, the, for those outside of Australia, the Whitsundays are 74 islands between the northeast coast of Queensland, Australia and the Great Barrier Reef. Um, lots of um, uninhabited islands, most of them are uninhabited, um, characterised by dense rainforest, hiking trails and white sand beaches. 
Airlie Beach is um, on the mainland as the region's central hub. So definitely some beautiful um, footage of the Whit Sundays. But back to the question about um, you know filming near aquatic animals. You know that's uh, certainly what I understand. That is correct about New South Wales. Has each state got to implement their own? Where does that sit in the regulations? Well, it does. I mean, you've got you've got a couple of different regulations overlying here. Once you've got a state, you've got state regulation. And you've got federal. So once you've got talking about the Barrier Reef, you're talking about one area in terms of um, state and federal demand for marine mm -hmm. life. Yep. First of all, to classify the the law uh, is enshrined in marine mammals only, not marine life. Um, look, at, it, it comes down to common sense. They put the rules there to give you a bit of a guideline. Um, and people will say, well, that's mandate craft. So my quads don't, makes nothing like the noise of a helicopter. Um, mm. We're not really sure about how, how marine mammals particularly are disturbed by, by strange things flying over them, whether mm. they use birds for navigation, seabirds, whether they use whatever. We, we just don't know enough about it. Mm. And these things still, you know, forever have been beaching themselves and, you know, all sorts of other reasons why we study. And people have fascination with them, so we obviously want to, want to film them. I think... Um, you know, 500 metres vertically um, is going to be a basic because you, you, after that, you're going to have problems with aircraft approaching, um, you know, airports, you know, but, uh, and, and even then it's probably a problem because approaching to land, if there were marine mammals around in a particular mm. harbour where you were landing, look, just be smart. You know, the, the main thing here is that, that don't harass these things. Keep a, keep a really good distance from them. Um I know that there are operators of marine vessels that have permits to go closer. So they're trained wildlife um, rangers, usually that are on the boats. Mm. They're either studying it for science or if they're doing charters and tours for people, they do know the animals that they're, you know, often they're going to see. They've got regular spots. The animals are used to it. If they're not migrating, they're sort of local to the area. So there's a whole lot of stuff that you wouldn't know. Um, but getting down low over over whales and dolphins, particularly, um, you know, down to where you could probably get good pictures of them, just not, uh, it's just not good sport. Um, so you know, don't do it. Yeah. Basically, um, it's not it's not really smart. So and you will get fined. You get fined if you get caught. That's for sure. People yeah. are very unhappy about it. You could probably test the privacy laws in court, but you won't have to test the private the laws for flying over marine mammals because they're already there. Absolutely. There's, there's, there's more robust laws in for flying over marine mammals than there are for flying over someone's property. So there you go. Yeah. Look, it's been a good show, and I thank you, John, as always, and thank you, Eric, for being part of it today. Just before yep. we wrap up, a couple of quick community service announcements. Please do follow us on social media, and my request to everyone here today, um, like the video, share it out, tweet it out, whatever it is you want to do to um, get our channel out there. We're trying to hit our target and just to have a look at where our numbers are in terms of subscribers at the moment, we'll put that up on the screen in a couple of moments. Um, but yeah, we're trying to grow and we're having fun doing it, but it's always helpful if you're growing and you see the results of your, your work. Let's get that Yes, up. yes. It's coming. Someone wasn't prepared for that shot. Oh, so <laughs> four more. Now, so 704. Someone will leave while you've got it up there. What? Well, hang on, hang on. There you go. Oh, We've there got goes. one oh. new one. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Hello. Thank you welcome. to the new person, whoever you are today. Yep. Okay, we'll take that off. But, um, yeah, please do share it and ask your friends to come and watch it. Ask them to subscribe. It would really help us out. Well, yep. that's all we've got time for today. John's rummaging and getting ready for something in the background. I don't Sorry, know. I've, what got, are you... I've got a soldering project going in the background and I'm getting ready to 3D print something again. So I'm in the workshop. I just can't. I get distracted here, I know. So 
I've got lots of stuff going. I've got a new fuselage here. This is a replacement for the uh, the Tundra, Grand Tundra fuse. It just yeah. arrived today on a Sunday from Hobby King. Thank you very much. There's a little plug for Hobby King. Uh, get a lot of stuff from them because it's cheap and quick and easy here, uh, as you probably find as well. Yeah. Uh, hey, I just forgot one thing, and that is um, how to upload and where is it? Is it that one? Oh, the titles are gone off the screen. That's not the one. Don't forget Drone Camp while you've That's got a not pause the one. there. DroneCamp.info. Everybody check it out next year. High school students, if you're uh, got uh, in high school, you've got people you know would be interested in it. And then, But here's Greg's um, for video now. Go for yeah, it, mate. Yeah, so if you've got a video that you want to send to us, upload at gregkunit.com. Please do also check out uh, DroneBook and DroneCamp, both of those. And, in fact, I'll set up something in the chat so next week it'll – Put some messages about drone camp in there as well. Thank you all. Okay. Look, that's all for today. It's been fun as always. Thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. Please give a thumbs up if you like us. If you don't, well, it's okay. You do whatever you got to do, but have fun. See you next time. See you later, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. See you next week.